since learning about the Brother Marshall's coming, uh, and since she accepted the invitation to preach, I've been looking forward to this, not for the reasons you expect, not because I get a break from preaching. Okay, I know, I know, I know. But because I get a chance to hear, as I joked, as I as I said to her, uh, as I greeted her during the during the greeting, the the, the time of fellowship, uh, she's the Jackie Robinson among us. Um, <laughs> Molly Marshall was the first woman to teach theology and at, at, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, and 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 I don't want us to forget that. You know, we talk about history. We talk about hidden figures, right? And, and we talk about people who are trailblazers. We often don't recognize the trailblazers among us. There's a trailblazer among us. There's a Jackie Robinson figure among us. There's a hidden figures figure among us in Molly Marshall. And Molly doesn't to her horn that way, but then she doesn't have to. She got made to do it this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so, and so I, I am not going to be shy about that. Molly Marshall was not only the first one to be hired, she also was fired. And I, I, want you to, I want you to understand that sometimes it is good to be known by folks you no longer work for. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, sometimes it's better to be known as having not stayed somewhere. Amen. Hello? Amen. I mean, it, there are places that we are sometimes blessed to be away from. <laughs> Central Baptist Theological Seminary has been blessed by Molly Marshall's presence for the last 25 years as a result of the injustice she suffered at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And she's been president of Central Baptist for about 10 years? 15. How time flies. How time flies. I want to encourage you to go to the website, Google her name, and learn all the most stuff about her that I can't tell you in this short time. I don't want to talk longer about her than she talks about God. To us. I simply ask that you remember that who we hear from this morning is really like the Jackie Robinson. Just like Jackie Robinson was the first black player to play in the major leagues, Molly Marshall was the first woman to be a theological professor in the leagues of the Southern Baptist seminaries. And quite frankly, and Molly, I say this without fear of contradiction, you're still the best. <laughs> you're still the best. You're still the all star. God bless you. It is a great joy to be with you today. A lot has happened in the four to five years uh, since I have been here. Your pastor can't stay out of trouble. Uh, your your faithful witness is known far and wide. My respect for you uh, as an inclusive congregation only grows. If Jesus were to visit you, I don't think he would need to proclaim with prophetic fire like he did at Nazareth. Uh, he probably would say, well done, good and faithful servants. Besides, you get enough prophetic fire all the while, I'm sure. I am so grateful for Pat and Wendell, if I may be so informal. They are grand servants of God, and I am grateful to be in their company. This morning, as I was checking out of the hotel, uh, the young man uh, at the desk said, Well, what brings you here? I said, The New Millennium Baptist Church. Oh, I know the Griffins, he said. Uh, he had worked with Elliot at uh, the Doubletree along the way. Lowell Dillard, Jr. Very fine, very fine young man. It was nice to be uh, in a community where your pastor and spouse 
are well known. It is the third Sunday after Easter, and these texts are all about how to pull together the astonishing thing that had happened, something that had never happened before. A person came to tell them that death was behind him. This fishing scene is remarkable in its detail, in its impact, and nothing less than the future of the church hangs in the balance, in the conversation that is going to transpire. You see, they've gone back to fishing. That suggests that they're not too sure about this reign of God project. After all, they've received the Holy Spirit, and yet they've returned to their former labor, at least in the Johannine tradition, which offers a wonderful window into the ministry of Jesus. Now, thankfully, this is not the only resurrection appearance in this gospel, but it is especially poignant because of this exchange between Jesus and Peter. You knew this had to happen. And, li- and John's literary artistry is on display. But wait, I'm getting ahead in the story. This is one of those that just kind of preaches itself, right. you know. The disciples have gone fishing, and they have come up empty. Jesus, whom they do not recognize stands on the shore and says, Do you have any fish? With exasperated eye rolls, who does he think he is? (laughs) They comply, and they have an abundance of fish. Now, what's often overlooked in this story is that there's a charcoal fire already cooking away. There's already fish. So why does he ask them to put down their nets? Did he want them to learn perseverance? Did he want them to learn just to dig deeper? He had fed them before. Why wouldn't he do it again? Why did he insist that they fish a bit more? Perhaps two things. They wanted him to trust his word and also to do their part in provision. After all, they had found the lad, you remember, who had the loaves and the fishes. Just when they're ready to throw in the towel, Jesus urges them on. Sometimes we rely on others so much that we don't know the value of our own efforts. And Jesus is teaching a lesson here. And the shared effort of hauling in the fish was constructive as the number and that the net was untorn. I'll get to those in a minute. I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and we had a pastor from Arkansas who loved to fish. This was his favorite text, and he celebrated that the men had returned to their prior vocation. And as a fledgling Jackie Robinson theologian, I wondered, why is he so happy that they've gone back? It was more about the fish than them not carrying out the mandate. Uh, And he would always emphasize the number. And so since a child, I've known 153 fish. Symbolic, perhaps, of all the known uh, fish species. One, five, three is also a number of completion when working in the Hebrew text. Uh, But actually, this is a miracle of abundance. The two miracles that book in Jesus' ministry, the wedding at Cana, more wine than they could drink, and here in the Galilee, again, more fish than they can possibly cook and eat. 
It's a miracle not only of abundance, it's a miracle of God's generosity. As Mary Oliver, the poet, says, joy is not meant to be a crumb. Amen. It is abundant. Amen. Well, it is the amount of fish that is caught which is the catalyst for the beloved disciples' recognition of Jesus. You know, the beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene are the two in the Gospel of John who kind of always get it. Yeah. Peter doesn't always. He just kind of acts and then backs up later. Peter, after the beloved disciple says, it's the Lord, jumps into the water, first dressing uh, in order to meet the Lord. I love that, getting dressed and then jumping in the water. Uh, another little piece of Johannine irony. And then they haul all the fish in as Peter has taken off. That the net remains unbroken signals that Peter has taken his role in drawing all to Christ. It's the same word as when I am lifted up, I will draw all. Now the drawing of the fish is symbolic that indeed his commission to fish for people and later to tend those caught is underway. And the untorn net, the reign of God, can hold us all. It is strong enough, knotted well together enough that it can hold us. And then we have this tender, tender scene. Jesus is cooking for his friends. He has prepared breakfast for them and he serves them as he had in the past. And by sitting down and eating with them, no one has to ask, who are you? They recognize in the breaking of the bread and in his service, it is the Lord. It's really the same meal that the miracle of John 6, it's fish and bread again. And Jesus is preparing it. Food first. And then forgiveness. Now this resurrection scene is really a fitting epilogue to the whole gospel. We've seen on subsequent Sunday evenings the appearance in the upper room. And it seems that John 20 comes to a close. But then you have this final story. Which is a summing up and a way of putting to rights a ruptured relationship between Peter and the Lord. Peter woefully fell short. And he was the one who boasted, right? right. <laughs> I'll never do that. According to Alan Culpepper, a world-class Johannine scholar who is a fine Baptist, he says Peter is the most complex character in the gospel other than Jesus. I would add Mary Magdalene to that also. Can you imagine how Peter was eager, not eager, to see Jesus? Interestingly, Jesus did not bring up the scene in the courtyard of the high priest's home, the scene of denial and ironically, the scene of another charcoal fire. Beautiful literary parallelisms here. Why add further shame to Peter? There was no finger wagging. There was simply a conversation that affirmed a leadership role for Peter. Forgiveness does not wait for repentance. 
God offers it. Indeed, as Miroslav Volf puts it, how can someone repent if we don't forgive? It's the forgiveness, actually, that evokes the awareness, even the shattering experience that a forgiven must undergo and the forgiver must extend. Yet Jesus grants this to Peter. Yes, Peter needed fish, but he needed forgiveness much more. What Jesus is calling Peter to do, care for the sheep, will require that he love Jesus unfailingly, and hence the interrogation. It will also ultimately require martyrdom, that final depiction when you're old, you'll be led where you don't want to go, and your arms will be stretched out. Probably Peter died in Rome. Probably the writing of John's gospel in Ephesus toward the end of the first century knew of the tradition of the big fisherman who was instrumental in Jerusalem and beyond in founding and leading the early church. When Peter three times affirms his love for Jesus, he has finished his preparation. He's been humbled. The promise of his earlier misdirected and unenlightened zeal can now be realized. He's ready to follow Jesus. And it's the same for us, dear sisters and brothers. If we would serve others well, it must come from the deep conviction that we are working alongside Jesus. We have received his commission. We have been strengthened for the work. And it will give our lives their greatest dignity. If we believe in resurrection, not just that of Jesus, but that of God's people, and this creation, we will believe that it's possible to move from despair to flourishing. Resurrection is not just about what happens when you and I die. It's about how we live our baptismal identity already risen to walk in newness of life. Now, this text asks Peter to do some important things. But the text also interrogates us. What is Jesus beckoning your love for him in order to be able to do? Jesus knows our names. You can always tell if a person loves us by how they speak our name. Isn't it wonderful to come out of a mouth, the mouth of a beloved, our name? And here Jesus, just as he had called Mary at the tomb, Simon, son of John, Peter knows he can trust that name calling from one who loves him. Jesus knows your name as well. And when we respond fully to the gift of his life to us, to his forgiveness, we will see the world differently. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote a, a rather hot column for Baptist News Global. Your pastor's not the only one who writes hot columns. <laughs> and basically, I said, when our president said he cannot recall ever needing to ask forgiveness of anything for anything. He has basically forfeited his claim to be a Christian. Amen. Forgiveness is at the very heart of this narrative. 
It is the gospel story that God loved us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, the ungodly that we are, who need provision, but who need forgiveness most of all. We can be resurrected beckoned to do his work in the world and he always gives us work to do just like the hall of fish we know that authentic christianity is in short supply these days there's too much hot air in the system deceptive corrupting and people are longing for faith affirmations that will make a difference on the social landscape. Uh, my sister Regina said, I won't be at the thing this afternoon because I have something else to do. Work that is important, raising money for a worthy cause. Justice calls us in these days. So Jesus comes alongside us he feeds us, he forgives us, he allows us to warm ourselves by his fire, the fire of the spirit, and bids us to tend the flock, feed the lambs, protect the vulnerable, bring them safely into God's fold. This story is a story of welcome. It's a story of restoration. It's a story of a new horizon being set before one who had failed. Thanks be to God who forever beckons us beyond where we find ourselves. Amen. Amen.